and welcome to the uh, December Jose Community Advisory Council meeting. I'm Dave Stoner, the chair. Um, we'll start as we always do with uh, introductions. Uh, Costas, you want to start? Costas, I'm first. Uh, CAC member. John McKinnon, Copas. I'm Jen Moore, I'm the Whitehall District um, Planning Commissioner on the Eagle. Kim Gunther, CCAC. Ann Mel, Whitehall District Supervisor. Holly Pesh, CCAC. Doug Bates, CCAC. Sam Vermeer, CCAC. Mike Kunkel, CCAC. John Bird, CCAC. Tom Lowe, CCAC. Can I introduce myself? Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Chris Hernandez with Models of Communications for the Tower Development. I'm Lori Schweller. I'm an attorney with Left Eye Ryan, and I'm representing Milestone Communications. Ryan Fletcher with Net Port Building and Consulting. We're representing Chantel and possibly Carrier because of Uh, Mark Graham, uh, Community Development, Outlaw County. I'm sitting in pinch hitting tonight um, due to illness for Chris Perez, who's the lead planner on this application. I'm Korea Wood, School Technology. I'm sitting in as well for Ira Sokol, who uh, could not be here tonight for the school side of the I'm, I'm Thomas Jackson, student at Western Memorial High School. Mary Ann Jackson. John Jackson. Rob Cushing, neighbor. Elizabeth Hillis, neighbor, adjoining property. Yes, Scott Hillis, neighbor. And the man behind the camera. Anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, we sent our agenda around, it's sort of short and sweet. Um, I think the one thing we may add since we're going to time, I think last time Costas, um, I think last time Costas made a suggestion about whether we wanted to say anything to the board of supervisors about the infrastructure needs in the area. So since we thought we had some time, um, we might discuss that briefly. Um, yeah, the concept of, of growth versus infrastructure, right? Because it's so, disproportionate. So anyway, we, since I've been some time, we're going to touch on that. Any other changes, additions to the agenda? All right, we'll go with it as it is. Um, there are minutes sent around. Thanks, Mike, as always. Um, I don't know if folks got a chance to look at those. If so, does anybody want to go ahead and move that? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Um, and with that, um, we'll go to the milestones. Uh, Lori and, and uh, um, Chris. Thank you, Dave. Thank you to the committee for allowing us to present to you today. This is an application that Milestone Communications submitted on October 30th, and we're in the early stages of zoning, and a community meeting is, is part of that process. And so um, you have graciously allowed us to use your regular committee meeting to have our community meeting to explain this project and to gather questions from you. Um, I have cards up here, and I want to share my contact information with everyone who may not have it. So this is just the beginning of our conversation, and feel free to contact me at any time after this meeting. Um, again, my name is Lori Schweller. I'm an attorney with Claire Ryan here in Charlottesville. I live in Corey Farm. I've been a, a member of this community for many, many years. Chris Hernandez is the project lead with Milestone Communications, and Ryan Fletcher is the zoning consultant with MBNC on behalf of Chantel, which is the dedicated carrier for this proposed facility. Um, also, on behalf of the schools, Crea Wood is here if we have questions about what the schools would like to do with um, this proposed facility. Just a little background on Milestone. It's Virginia-based, it's in Northern Virginia, and their business model is to partner with municipalities and school systems in order to construct wireless facilities to share rent with those landlords and then to rent out space on the monopoles to wireless carriers. The 
financial benefit of this proposed wireless facility for Western Alamore, um, those benefits are listed here. They're the same as the ones we have had zoned, and um, actually one is being constructed at Alamore High School and Stony Point Fire Department. And they are for a 10 year lease term or four or five year extensions. Um, there are fees, one time fees, when the pole is constructed and the carriers go on the pole, and then there's rent sharing with the schools. The reason this facility is needed is there is a coverage gap. This is a computer modeling showing wireless coverage provided by Chantel. This area here is the area that Chantel is trying to cover and this map shows you with computer modeling what that coverage would be. I want to show you that all together. And in relation to Google Maps, you have a sense of what this coverage area is. Chantel is a dedicated carrier for this proposed facility, but we have interest, Milestone has interest from Verizon and T-Mobile. Verizon has begun work with them on a lease and um, discuss terms. Here's another map so you can get a sense of the coverage area. All right, so this is the site location. This is Russian Avenue here, and the football field. There's, there are woods here, and the proposed site location is here on the edge of the football field. Um, it's about 14, 1,450 feet to Route 250, and we're showing here the distance to the closest house. Your names. We're looking behind the bleachers. The access to the site is actually under the bleachers, but this will be the construction entrance, and then the site will be back here. It's not going to affect the bleachers at all. Yeah. Which which bleachers are those? The football field. Yes. Oh, oh right. So this is just to give you a sense of, this is the construction entrance here, but once the, if the facility is constructed, the access for the um, technician who comes to check on it once or twice a month is under the features of the access. So the design is a, is a small lease area that would have room for multiple carriers. There would be um, cedars in the front for screening. This is an elevation a schematic to show the type of facility we're talking about, a monopole, which will be painted brown with brown antennas. And so these are, it's again, just a schematic showing antenna arrays. Um, the top height would be 145 feet. And then we're requesting from the county a special exception to permit up to five <coughs> carriers. The Albemarle County Zoning Ordinance permits up to three carriers by rights so a special exception is required for more. And the reason why this is important is because um, carriers today use so many technologies that to get all of their technologies and to provide adequate service um, at one point on, on a pole, um, they need to have this type, of, this type of design. This will allow the schools up top, which is a free, uh, free rent here, hotel here, and then Verizon and T-Mobile and the other carrier. Can you ask a question? How, how wide is the array? How wide are those the top? Um, this is 96 inches. We'll provide it. This is 40 inches here. So there will be one, there will, there will be three array, uh, excuse me, three antennas on each of these triangular sides. 12 feet across, 14 feet across, something like that. Outside, outside. 
um, right here, 12 feet right here. Right, and left to right, so it's going to be... Right, and then 40 inches from right here. That's the center of the monopole. Yes. 18 inches. Yes, and, and this note is just to indicate that um, for treetop monopoles in Elmore County, this, the performance standard is 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches, and so we're, we're requesting a special exception. This is a tier three, which requires a special use permit, um, so without getting into too much detail, um, the, these special exceptions are requested for each of those differences from a tier two, and I'd be happy to answer questions about that. It's rather complicated. Can you say again what the stamp off is? Yes. Greater than about 18. So the standoff for a tier two monopole is 12 inches from the face of the monopole to the back of the antenna at its closest point. And if the antenna is tilted, then 18 inches is permitted from the face of the monopole to the back of that antenna where tilted. That's the maximum 18 inches. That's called a flush mounted antenna. Um, what we're proposing here this is not exactly the face of the monopole, but it's approximately 40 inches from the monopole to this face. So, okay. So, so what's the what's the parameter that's an apple to apple comparison? So, what's the distance from the back to the pole? It, it's roughly 40 inches. Roughly 40. So it sticks out from the ball for you? Yes, yes. As um, opposed to the inches. That's exactly. Right. Th this okay. is the, I'm sorry, this is a cross section. So this is the monopole. Okay. And then the antennas are placed along each of these three faces. So do the antennas stick out from this? Mm -hmm. um, so the antennas are perpendicular to each one of these bars. Right. So it's actual this is going to be more so what we're showing you is a triangle like this on a monopole and the antennas are placed vertically on the side i'm just saying so this doesn't include the antenna that's correct they say they're placed vertically they don't stick further out horizontally that's correct okay, okay. right um, unless they're tilted okay. sorry i was trying to go back so i could show you the, the elevation but i seem to be going in the wrong direction So at each level, there's a platform, and then those antennas are attached to the side vertically. So the maximum standoff would be, let's say, 40 inches. And, and what's the, the height of the tree line? Um, the total height of this facility is 145 feet. The, the tree line would be roughly 80, 80 feet, 70 to 80 feet. So we've got 70 to 80 feet above tree line. Well, it depends on, and the reason I'll show you photographs is it depends on your vantage point as to how, much, how far it appears above the tree line. So we'll show you those photographs. Sure. And, and that actually is the purpose of the balloon test, which I'm describing. So that you can actually see what that looks like. I don't know if you'll make this, but what is the school use? One for I don't know if that's a naive question, but sure. Um, <laughs> and, and we can get into that in great detail, but I can't answer the question. Um, the school will be installing LTE wireless as part of their broadband project. Um, they they have currently there are antennas on Albemarle High School, and they're moving those to the milestone monopole at Albemarle High School and at other schools. They have a network, and it's a closed network for okay. students. Okay. So those are currently out of the building as well. They are not at Western. Mm -hmm. But they could be they're they're right out, they're they're out, out the building. Right. So they're on the building. They're alternative. Alternative. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, um, yeah, so the question is, is this for Albemarle County schools or just the school itself I mean, school itself to use for the students? The entire division. Schools. Okay. Oh, so okay. That, that, I just wanted to understand that. Okay. Oh. 
this connects one school to another school. Mm -hmm. No. So the school system has wireless spectrum, just like any of the companies, Verizon, T-Mobile, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this would be essentially as we were a carrier. We would be plugged into our own network and be able to broadcast that signal and have units out at schools with students that would be able to connect back to this wireless signal. And essentially it's an extension of our network that we already have in the schools. In the and, and, and please don't, don't take this as me challenging the schools, but sure. this is a, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it pretty is. giant, I mean, do you need that much reach? I guess, do you need this magnitude of reach to reach just the school? <coughs> is that what you're trying to cover? We're trying to cover the community. So this, this project, the overall scope is to reach to the students, locations that students are in, in which they may not have access to that kind of wireless technology. And so we'd be able to provide them that access in which it would tie back into our system. So when you say reach to them, what do you mean by reach? Is that a mile, five miles, 10 miles? What kind of reach are you looking at? The higher you can get, the further we can go, kind of stuff. So uh, uh, 15 kilometers is usually the max that we can get with our, our equipment that we'll be putting up there. And do you have a survey of how many underserved children are around the school? That's probably going to be a better question for Ira. I believe they do have those maps, those population maps, and then as well as our estimated coverage maps that we've thrown together. This is just to show the owners that we notified of the balloon test and of the community meeting. And now I'd like to show you to answer the previous question, what we foresee is potential visual impact from the facility. We did a balloon test in September before the leaves were off the trees and driving up and down 250 and Miller School Road. I wasn't able to see the balloon. Just to back up a step, a balloon test is great, literally raising a balloon to the proposed height of the facility. It's a four foot in diameter red balloon and then and it's on a string that you know to make sure that it's exactly the right height. And then we drive around, we take photographs, and we create photo simulations. When the leaves are on the trees, the site is not visible except immediately in front of the school. And I'll show you that photograph. But when we did the second balloon test, the public one, about which you were you all were notified, the um, there were other there were additional locations where the where the balloon could be seen primarily through the trees when they don't have leaves on the trees four months out of the year. So I'll show you those and show you the photo simulations created from the photographs. This is the photograph from 250 in front of the school. The, the arrow is pointing to the red balloon. This is a close-up of the same location. And the diameter of the brown pole, excuse me for interrupting, sure. from the balloon down, it's like two feet in diameter at the top and goes down to 36 inches at the bottom, the diameter of the model. It's, it's not a standard 18 inch at the top, 36 inch at the bottom brown pole. Um, I don't think I have... I mean, it's different than a string as far as its visibility mm -hmm. oh, it will be significantly different than what yes. you're showing in the picture. And that's part of the reason we do the photo simulations to show, um, and, and it's... That's the simulation. So that's the simulation right there. Yes. This is what it's going to look like. And that has oh, one tier, and you would have five. So you have a simulation of the five tiers on there, because that would look radically different as well. We don't. We don't. Um, so is that the top or the four more up? No, that's the top. So they will get oh, down. Down. Right. But, but the bulk of it. Right. Yeah. May, I, may I interrupt for just a quick because I, I may have missed something and I just want to be sure I understand. So Almar High School right now has these antenna, whatever you call them, on, this, on the school itself and they've moved it to a mono for the school. And what Ann was saying earlier is that for Western Almar High School to get this, they could also have something like that installed on the school building itself. So the advantage to this is, and I'm asking the question, mm -hmm. is it that it can reach more students versus just having the antenna on the school, which is a lower building, um, but also what is the, 
economic incentive of this because um, that that I'm wondering which is the driver of this if we're really trying to help the students but now we're going to have five arrays on a large pole and Verizon's in it and Sprint's in it and whoever else is in it I'm, I'm wondering which what's more important to the county right it, it is a twofold benefit um, so as Creo was saying when you have the antennas 145 feet off the ground, you're able to promulgate that signal much farther. Also a stronger signal, a better signal to students in the area. And we, we did have modeling maps when we did Albemarle High School to show how many more students would be served um, in the area, students who didn't have broadband otherwise. It's a, it's a closed, you may be familiar with it, but the school has a closed internet system that the, the students use and, and Teacher's use administration use. And could, could I interrupt? Uh, I'm, I don't have a kid in the schools right now, so I, I don't know. Uh, this is just for the high school. But we have uh, middle school, we have two elementary schools here as well. Right. Does this access them or does it make them more involved and engaged in, in this uh, network? So it's for the entire division. So there is no distinguishing between high school, middle school, elementary school. So once that ups, that's broadcasting a signal, then the student, whatever level they're at, would have a device. And if they can receive that signal or within that range and have it strong enough, they then will receive that signal and would be directly attached into the school system as if they were sitting in the class. Okay, so there is currently, or there could be, uh, an array on the Western Alabama High School right now. Sure. But that probably wouldn't reach that would not be as beneficial as 145 feet, just from a propagation standpoint to to the extension of, of the wireless technology. And once we know where the real service gaps are, right. we might be able to actually say that. So this and the Alamore High School are just two, uh, which we the benefit is we can be on a pole that is at that height. There are other installations that are going to happen across the school division on schools or school sites that will just be on the top of the building itself. Okay. So this, these are just two of 20 plus that are strategically positioned in here. But as we move forward, we'll be able to see those students, the coverage that students would get from this versus something mounted on the side of the school. I don't know if we have a propagation from the top of Western Albemarle. High school. Uh, I think that we had a model from Henley, I believe, was more of the central location when we had first looked at schools where they're at, uh, just because of where Western is lying and where we would have to put it. Um, so we have a model from this tower and we have one from Henley. So it's not too far off from Western, but yes, you would be able to, to see the, the difference between those two. And I believe Vince, before Vince left, had a lot of that uh, documentation and presentation. So I would assume the IRA would possibly would have it or be able to get a hold of it. If he, and this would benefit students who are strictly working on school work, or does this basically give their household internet access? School work. So it would be a limited, it, just as if we do in the classrooms, that uh, it would be limited and filtered Can't go for, for use. It's not, it's not for parents to jump on in Netflix. It, it is. It, technology that, that can be gobbled up real quick, a ton of people are on it. And again, we're not a horizon. But so the capacity and the infrastructure is not there like you see going down 64. Uh, so we know that. So it has to be limited. It has to be focused on, on the real needs. So this is going to show up. So if I had my phone or my laptop, if I'm a student, it's going to show up as like Western Albemarle, so closed a network. CPS. The same way as you walk into this building, it's the same way when you walk into this building, it's the JMRL okay. Wi-Fi with the ACPS Wi-Fi, and you have to say agree, but they have to log in because I won't be able to. It, it's it's LTE technology. It's than this yeah. So hotspots, yeah. cell phones, they have uh, outdoor units. These are these are units. So there's a bunch of different options, and I know that that's being talked at. At a, at a different level than where I'm at right now. Um, uh, the logistics of how to distribute and how, what that system looks like and a support infrastructure for that. 
Was it Hillis? Is it Hillis? Yes. Thank you. Um, so to finish <coughs> answering what you really asked me, the impetus was um, Dean Tisdat, who is head of IT for the schools. I'm sorry, it's probably not his correct title. Um, he was in Northern Virginia, and he had worked in Fairfax County with Milestone for many school facilities. And then when he came to Albemarle County, he was very much interested in getting this type of partnership with Milestone again to provide better service to the school system. But the other benefit, you're absolutely right, is the economic benefit that being a landlord for Milestone's tower. Not only does the school not only that it doesn't have to construct the tower, it doesn't have to pay rent for the service that it receives, but it actually receives fees and rent from the carriers. So it receives fees, the school system would receive fees from Verizon and Sprint and like any anybody else who is on has an array? It's, it's through Milestone, but the lease for sure. Milestone provides that, let's say, Chantel goes on. Uh, well, the, the monopole is built. The school gets $20,000. Chantel goes on. It gets $5,000. Each time another carrier goes on, it gets $5,000. Throughout the life of that lease, which may be 25 years, the school gets 40% of all rent coming from every carrier on there you know, through the milestone payments. So over the course of time, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, Andy, just a quick question. Um, is that going to the general fund or does it go directly to the school? It goes to the school, sorry, actually. It doesn't go to the general fund. So, to which schools, though? The, the whole school department. So, the so school does system, go to the school. not the county. School general funds, not county general funds. Okay. So, it doesn't directly benefit Western. Or the other Crozet school boards. Now, does the school board take into account where these towers are? Since they're 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 sort of, I mean, if we decide to host the tower, wouldn't it make sense to proportionally benefit from having this tower? Western, you mean? Yeah, Crozet schools. Right? I mean, we'd be the ones sort of most affected. Then it goes back into the general fund and gets divvied up to everybody. That seems strange. Anyway, that's not your issue. I'm sorry. Hmm. Monopole um, structures in that configuration, how many have Milestone uh, deployed, and what is the safety uh, record of those against wind, fire? How many towers in total? How many towers in that configuration has Milestone deployed? And what is the safety record of that tower with that configuration? I mean, at this point, over 100, and there has never been any incident. 100 with four mm -hmm. on top. So last <coughs> year, when we had the fire, that was not your tower? It, it, in uh, another location here in Virginia, when a, a um, cell phone tower caught on fire? I don't think so, because I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, the other question I have is with the um, enhanced uh, reach of this, do we have infrastructure, and I think we've talked about it, but I'd, I'd be very interested in seeing how we array the infrastructure that's going to be necessary to drive the traffic once it hits the, the network, right? So, so we're going to ostensibly put this thing up, and then we're going to have a whole bunch of people uh, looking at a spinning ball uh, while uh, the infrastructure at the school level um, process it is the packet traffic uh, from the increased uh, volume of, of inbound traffic, right? So, so we're going to be beefing up the infrastructure, right, to take take advantage of the, the traffic. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the technology has its, its limitations. So uh, again, the spectrum that Albemarle County owns isn't uh, as large as some of the corporations have. So. Uh, They've, they've built and bought a lot of that spectrum to be able to do what you do when it comes to that video streaming. That, that goes back to that it will have to limit uh, what type of technologies, what type of, uh, of applications can be used when connected to it. Um, so there is a finite limitation to uh, the spectrum that we have and how fast it can go and how many users are on that. But, but, but is it fair to say that the spectrum is not the rate limit? The, the rate limiter will be the infrastructure at the school level that will be able to process the, the information coming from the spectrum. 
So the, the school system's infrastructure is quite robust and a lot of credit to Vince uh, with the uh, upgrade that he's done, but we have a 10 gig backbone between all of the schools themselves as well as to the data centers and then on top of that, they aggregate 10 gigs of internet bandwidth as well. So I, I don't foresee a, a bottleneck when it comes to the, the fiber optic infrastructure connecting that tower to the school, to the WAN between the schools. It, it, for, from my standpoint, it would be the actual spectrum um, and how many devices are connected to that wireless technology. I, I guess that, that's kind of the point, is if, if you're inviting a whole bunch more people to connect, then even with 10 gig, you're going to stress that. And that's, is that dark fiber that we've leased? Or? So I believe we have 14,000 students, I think, give or take-ish, in the school division. and. Roughly on the heaviest days that we see internet traffic, we do not reach above a gig and a half of actual internet traffic. That does not take into account way in traffic between the schools, but that would be pure students accessing internet resources back in and out. That they, they reach and max out about two gigs out of the 10 that are currently there. Right, and, that, and that's between the schools. Now if we take it down to within the schools themselves, we don't have fiber optic uh, cables within Western Allen you know, High School, as near as I can tell. We do. We do. So, so we're, we're the, able to network between classrooms via fiber optic and wireless. The infrastructure within the building is uh, is brought into the school either by our own fiber optic or by uh, leased CenturyLink fiber optic, and then within the building is distributed out to the different wings or different areas of the school via fiber fiber optic, and then from that point, from the switch, it is copper. So cat cat six copper. Gigabit connections from there. So gigabit is your is your rate limiter then uh, for the last mile for, to say within the school. Like, within the school for the wireless uh, wireless access points inside the school, yes, each wireless access point has a one gig uplink to do. It. Thank you for instructional space. Yes. This is also from front of the school uh, near the. Uh, the soccer field, and that's the photo simulation uh, with the facility in the bathroom. This is, of course, on the school property, so obviously you will see the home quite clearly. Um, there's the balloon, and there's a photo simulation. This is at the intersection with Old Trail. It's hard to see with the lights, uh, but you can see the photo simulation. These are photographs that Ms. Jackson provided me from her own property. And you can see um, there's the balloon through the trees. This is a location, Savannah Court, next to the school, where when the leaves were on the trees, I didn't see the balloon during the September balloon test. Um, so in the months when the leaves are off the trees, um, you'll see it through the trees. And this is one of the reasons why we're using brown. It looks kind of gold, but it actually is, is a specific brown color that the county has decided um, for wireless facilities. This is, uh, this is also the same property, just more photographs, uh, another photograph and a photo simulation. I will take issue as the property owner that that is above the tree line, and the trees that you see partially obscuring the view are actually in the foreground. So it does appear above the tree line from our uh, from the top of the river. This is a, um, we're standing on 250 in front of Brownsville, and we're looking across the street. These are photographs taken by the county planner Chris Perez. There's the balloon, and this is a photo simulation. So we're looking down a private driveway, and um, this is the home end of the private driveway and one of the property owners is here. And so these are photographs that a county planner took from that location. I do think with future presentations we should add all five tiers to that because it just was way bulkier with five. Um, and, and that's perspective, yeah. but that's a good point. Um, I, I, the balloon isn't visible in this in this photograph, the county planner took it and um, has to be a this one. So this is a view. We're in the old trail now, and we're looking at 
quite a distance. It's hard to see the balloon from this distance. So um, with the zoom, you can see the balloon and the distance. And so in my opinion, this photo simulation is far more uh, has far more impact than it will in real life. Just from my experience, I mean, this is heavily zoomed, um, but we produce photo sims that we were asked to produce based on photographs that we received. As you can see, that distance in that previous picture is a mile and a half, so it, it's not going to look like that at that distance. Um, why not? It's, I don't understand the connect the disconnect. Well, I wish we could make them a little more. It's just at that distance, it's very difficult to see, and especially through the trees. You can see here again. When the leaves are on these trees, you won't see the facility. Um, and then when they are, you know, but we're not able to make it look like it's behind the trees. It looks like it's in front of the trees. So that's the best we can do here. Um, this is a, a property immediately behind the school, Emerald Blaine, and the, um, the balloon is visible from this property. You can see that this is the property and this is the school. So we have several photographs from this location, right at the driveway, the photo simulation. Across the field, it's so close to the school that you can see the ball field lights there in, in the background. And so um, there's the field again. And so, and again, it looks like it's right. Number five, that, that's significantly different from that. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is from Miller School Road, and from Miller School Road, the views were through the trees. It's quite a distance um, to the school at that point. Can I ask another question? Can you explain again why, and uh, I missed this in the uh, description, why it's Instead of going from um, being on top of the school, but it's in a location off the football field, different than I guess how it is at uh, Alamore High School. Is that well, Alamore High School had some antennas on the school at the time that Milestone found its application to construct the facility there. Right. And the schools wanted to get those antennas bigger and higher and more robust. And so that's why they wanted that monopole there. And that monopole has been constructed. Western does not have antennas, I understand, from Korea. Um, so this is a dramatic improvement of service for the schools in that location. How tall is the pole at the I think it's 125. So we're not even talking about half the stack, right? Because it's... Well, it's, it's a lot. This is 145 and that was 125? But I think it's 125 <coughs> and it's, um, it's also close to the ball field um, in that area. The schools select the location based on other uses of the property. And, well, yeah, that's all the does land. it have a similar setup? Array, multiple arrays? Um, it has, I believe, a max of four. How tall is the you know how tall the lights are at the football field? Just, so they say. 80 to 90 is over the mm -hmm. And how um, firm is the 145? <laughs> is, <laughs> I mean, is it like, if we don't do 145 economically, it doesn't make sense, so we're not interested? Or is there wiggle room to lower it, understanding that you'll get less coverage, but that's a potential trade-off? There is a trade-off, because at 145, each carrier can use one point on the monopole for all of its technology, for the best service, separation of the wavelengths on the spectrum, all of them. If, if it has to be shorter, um, then you won't get as many carriers on there. Um, you know, ideally, every carrier needs to serve this area to be here, and then you wouldn't have other wireless facilities dotting Crozet. That would be the goal. But if it were shorter, you would, you would have fewer carriers. And less rent. I want to question about the base that the monopole is located on top of. Do you know the material and the surface area of non-absorbent surface that we're put in? I believe it's concrete uh, that the monopole is set into. So will you be evaluating the impact on soil erosion rates in the local area 
as a result of including service yes. in the service area. Um, did you do that with Albany Hospital, and what were the findings with that? Yes, there's a lot of due diligence that goes into building these facilities um, based on federal regulation, state regulation, and local regulation. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that data with me to answer questions about it, but I'd be happy to share it later. Do you have a photograph of the Albemarle Pole and the base that he was just discussing? Is there a photograph of actually what this is going to look like or that you have? I don't know. Or any of what the other existing, oh. yeah, from the existing, any of the people? Yeah, the, the ground equipment won't be visible off-site. It, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lease area, fenced, um, <laughs> landscaped. So unless you're going into the lease area, you wouldn't see any of the cabinets or equipment that support the monopole. And that's why we only do photo simulations of the monopole from off-site parcels. Um, but we can certainly get those photos for planning commission here and for the supervisors here. The measurement of your ground equipment release is what dimension? I, I saw it on one of your drawings earlier. I just didn't catch it. It's roughly 2,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. Made by 100. Mm -hmm. 2500. <laughs> okay, so that's totally paved and then has structure on top of it. Okay. Um, is it totally paved or does it have gravel between the lease areas? So it's a fence in area. It's basically a big square right. and it's gravel on the ground and then you have the cabinets installed on top on the concrete pads. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's completely blocked and closed in. It's fenced in, it's glass for concealment. Rarely ever opened. These uh, our towers don't need a lot of wings. So typically you may have one person who visit, and then we have regulations in place for the schools in terms of people checking in, so people can visit the facility and all that. So those uh, procedures have been set in place. Is it outside the existing fence around the football field? It's on the other side of the fence, mm -hmm. in the tree area. So it's, you're cutting down all those trees right next to the field right there? There will be some there, yeah. yes. So there are critical slopes in that area. The only there is a running slopes. path through there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to hear from those who live right next to it. What do you guys think about this? I'm concerned. I use that walking path to walk home every single day, so you can directly put yourself in the way of me walking home. Um, my other concern is that um, due to the location being a more steep forest, and even in the recent years with the heavier rain seasons in the summer, just naturally I've seen walking on that path, heavier rates of sloping on the hill, you know, more soil erosion due to just natural rain. And um, my concern is that the construction equipment rolling in the heavy machinery used to install this unit will damage the root systems of the topsoil enough to cause flow and that I don't think that remediation just from moving the construction equipment back and forth to put this thing in place, I don't know if remediation would be immediate enough to prevent enough soil erosion that enough with aesthetics affecting the property itself, soil flowing down the hill affects the natural area which is accessed on our property, which means that we have soil flowing down and compiling at, in the basin of our property, which would be a discourager for future owners to let, to enjoy the natural areas of the property if there's increased soil collection and sedimentation at the base. So my concern is that environmentally, <coughs> this will have severe impacts because of construction at the tops of hills, unless you're doing full remediation of the soil to ensure that topsoil loss is not happening, it has a much more long-term effect that's harder to remediate other than just dumping more dirt on top and holding it in and you still don't get rid of that dirt that's at the bottom. The county will be in control of that steep slopes issue that you talk about during construction, though there are no steep slopes in the area of the lease area. The construction will involve that, so we will have to get permitting that the county will monitor for construction on the you, you asked about uh, other landowners. Uh, we're the closest property to the... Uh, with a Z that goes around. Yeah, with a Z everything. that wraps around us. So we're, <laughs> we're 30 feet from, from this structure. 
And, uh, you know, my take on it is that, you know, we've got crappy cell phone service in our house. And if Verizon is able to be on the tower and we can talk on our phones in our house, yes, we have to look at a, a pole that's not so attractive. But from my standpoint, I'm okay with that. Um, it's, pro it's progress. It helps the school. So that's, that's my can I go back to the school question? I, I wanted to follow up. Um, the, um, the students currently at uh, Western Alabama, mm -hmm. how do you access the proprietary network that's available through the Alabama kind of public school? So two different wireless technologies, but the internal wireless technology, the students use their actual laptops with the built-in radios. That, yeah, that and what do they log into? Oh, so, so the two signals that are currently uh, on Alabama County Schools are ACPS and ACPS Public. And <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm not being as technical as sure, I should sure. be. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how students reach the system currently and how many more students would be able to be reach the system. School. I'm sorry? It's going to be at the school, right? For, for this technology, for the LTE technology, it's, it's think about it, it's just, as, just like your phone. We would have SIM cards, we would I'm have devices. Right now. Now. Oh, now? So they, they have to be at the school or within proximity of a wireless access point that is installed in either Okay, so it's like a router in the school. Yes. Okay. So I think the first one is the press box has a wireless access point that. Okay. That gives and, and so you have short a map coverage. up there very briefly that showed the reach, the extension that this tower would get for the students. For Chantel. That, for that Chantel. map is only for Chantel. Which um, we don't have a propagation map for the school that is present. For the other, for, and this is what you were asking about. That This is what we need, right? Well, it's not what the board is going to deal with, because we have wireless ordinance we have to deal with. And I'll ask Mark to address that in a few minutes. But as far as the numbers of children served, I think that would be appropriate information. If you're using the schools as a reason to do this, it would be nice to know what the real impact is. Right. That's so exactly that was what my question was. Yeah. Sorry. I have a question. Just what is the economic incentive for milestone to put it at the school? Like, why do you want to do it at the school as opposed to you know somewhere else, private property? Um, well, you know, it's just our business model. That's you know our business model is we work with municipalities and we work with public entities, and that's where we're experts in the industry. Um, going to public partner partnerships and share revenue with uh, those partners that we make. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years. Probably our biggest client where we've built the most towers is Fairfax. Um, I've been working with them for 30 years, and I've built approximately 12 towers in front of the schools, um, in front of the schools, principal and county parks. So I mean, it's just the business model. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. It's the niche you all have. Yes. And then, is there any health studies as far as you know radiation from these towers for people hanging out underneath them? Yeah. yeah. What's the Federal Communications Commission. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the Federal Communications Commission has adopted a set of standards that all carriers must comply with, and facilities like like we're showing to you today um, typically put out effective radiation of hundreds to thousands times less than what is permitted. Um, there are lots of studies online, I, and I have slides on this. I didn't know how interested people would be in something that is not put out. The locality is not permitted to consider health effects okay. when deciding on the special use permit because it is preempted by federal law. And as long as we comply with federal law, it's not a zoning consideration. But I'm happy to share with you any, any information about health effects if you would like. I have slides with that information. I guess the county's not allowed to, but I mean, as a citizen, I can. If you Google it, it will come to you very <laughs> But I could also, I, that could affirm my yeah. opinion on whether or not to be there. I'm going to take yes, away absolutely. your phone now. <laughs> okay. I just mean, you know, are you at the end of it? I don't want to ask Mark his, his thing. I'm at the end of my presentation. Yes. Okay. Can I ask yeah, one more question? Because you did mention Verizon and whatever, somewhere. 
T-Mobile. Yeah. T-Mobile. Right. These are just people who you may have lease agreement arrangements with. These aren't. They, 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 they've I given mean, milestone letters of interest to mm -hmm. say that if you are able to construct this tower, this is an area where we would like to improve our service. Um, I just learned from Chris today that they're now in negotiations with Verizon for actual lease, the contingent on zoning, etc. Um, so that's as far as it is. They're, they're not 100% committed the way Chantel is at this point. Can I ask one quick question, Miles? And again, so you've been doing this about 10 years with municipalities and schools and so forth. Are there any instances when schools and municipalities have not renewed a lease because they weren't happy with the arrangement? For a single tower? Yeah. So typically, the it's about a dirty year lease. So I haven't experienced that. Um, so, so, so this is a long-term lease. Uh, there might be, there could be. There's no reason. There's you know they even if they have the right to terminate the lease uh, under certain terms, it just depends on the term of lease. But typically, no. We haven't had any issues with that have to happen. Maybe there's a question back here. Yeah, I just had a question and a comment. Um, there's a lower field from the football field, and I'm just wondering if you explored that as a potential site. The decision to put the site here was made by the schools, um, similar to Albemarle High School. It wasn't a milestone decision. This is where the school said, you can put this on our here. I had the same question. I drove around and, and, and wondered, you know, why not here, why not here, why not here? And this is the location that worked with the schools and... and okay. So, do you have that answer? I know, so that was, that was Dean Tisdale's uh, level of... So that's more of a facilities use question because they look at the whole property and they say, right. what do we use it for? Where are the sports, the activities, foot traffic? Um, where can we tuck this away in the property where it can have the least impact on their activities? Because their priority is to serve the school activities and students, and they're not going to put it anywhere where it yeah. might interfere with their use of the property. So or future use. Or future yeah. use, expansion, or anything like that. I, I guess the other comment I make is uh, I'm, I'm cushioning there in the little rectangle. Yes. I want to thank Scott for his early secessional forest that actually blocks the view. <laughs> but I think everyone should understand that you know this was all farmland not that long ago. So the trees that you see growing there are uh, not that old and they're pretty weak. So all it takes is a, a hurricane or a windstorm to come through and people's exposure to the sight line of the tower could be radically changed. So. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an unusual property area because it's heavily residential and right next to a school. Um, so I just I want people to understand that. Uh, I think Scott's not planning to do any clearing because there's a nice little wetland area down in there too that um, Stockton Creek actually feeds into. So it's a pretty sensitive area and I appreciate the, the young person here sort of recognizing some of the localized potential impact. Mm -hmm. And that's what prompted my question regarding the safety of the tower itself. Mm -hmm. uh, because we were affected by the direction there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I have no earthly idea how many of these things are up in that configuration for how long. We have structural engineers who do those measurements for the, the wind with the loading that is proposed. <clears throat> so with the maximum loading, they would provide that report, and that's done for every site. I don't have any knowledge of a site that's failed. Um, do, you, do you know what the standards are that it's built to? I don't so know that when you're talking winds, do you talk of the derecho? I mean, this is going to be more, more common of occurrence rather than less. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. every year, but this is not, not going to be surprising if we have something of that level come through again. So. Um, question would be is what, uh, what what is the standard and that that's a and you know, very valid question based upon that. Uh, we have a lot and then we have as Mallet knows we have lots and lots of personal wireless service facilities as, as our zoning ordinance calls wireless facilities throughout the county. There are lots in our area in fact. Um, and they are small and usually um, 30 inches at the base and 18 inches at the tall at the top and 
um, when the derecho came through, none of those was toppled. So I, you know, I feel quite confident that something like this would be constructed to withstand. Yeah, Lori, if I could, I'd just jump in and note one thing. I don't know if it got called everyone's attention. The circle that you see around the site is the fall zone. If the tower fell over, that's the area it would fall within, which has to be totally within the property that it's on, or they have to have an agreement or an easement for the adjoining property that is going to go on to that. So it's, it's tended to be there. I, I will say, as, as an engineer who's, who's sort of, through the erosion and sediment control program, seeing them build the foundations on these things, I, I'm always surprised how over-engineered they are. Uh, but I guess it's concrete's relatively cheap versus your investment in that tower and all that equipment. So uh, you would rather put a little extra in and make sure that things aren't going to blow over. So. This is the first one, in my knowledge, that has five layers in the county. And that's going to increase the drag. For sure, and also the greater width that you're starting to, the companies are starting to place now also has a far greater exposure than 18 inch offset flush mounts that we've gone with far. So you mentioned up there treetop category in one of your sidebars. Uh, also that when the leaves are all on the trees, it wouldn't be visible. And yet the photo I took and you showed a little bit further away one there by the football field, 70 per 60 per 70 percent of the pole is completely exposed and our treetop ordinance is described as 7 to 10 feet above the closest tree and this is 60 to 70 feet above the closest tree and so I don't understand how this meets even remotely um, the ordinance that we have to use to address uh, whether it works or not so well, I just this want, is I want tier, to address that yeah. this is a tier three yeah I was going to say what she's saying is right it's a tier three the, the towers that are 7 to 10 feet, those are considered what we call tier 2. That does not require a special use permit, which is an important point. You know, and I think you were asking to jump in on the process here. Uh, what they're asking for here with a special use permit is a discretionary act by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, that will require what the steps are with going through the initial analysis, the blue test, the doing the community meeting, you get your input. There will be a staff analysis that will be provided in early January. The next step is the applicant has to decide if they want to go forward with the application as, as originally submitted or if they want to make modifications to it. Assuming they don't make modifications, it would stay on the schedule to go to the planning commission by uh, February 20th. The Planning Commission would hold a public hearing taking input from, from the public on, on the application and then make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. It would then be scheduled for a second pub, another public hearing with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, if it was in February 20th, which is the Planning Commission, tentative Planning Commission date, it would probably be the April meeting. We have certain regulatory federal regulatory requirements we have to meet as far as the processing time for these applications. Mm -hmm. So we have to be a little concerned with that. Um, so at the Board of Supervisors, they would then get, receive the Planning Commission's recommendation, have another opportunity for the public to provide input, and then they would have to make a decision weighing the impacts as, as have been noted here, and, and probably be noted in the staff analysis against other factors. Uh, you know, for example, um, is one tower with five sets of arrays better than five towers with one set of array, which might be an alternative to this, and trying to measure how, how acute is that visual impact that's being created with this thing. I, I will note one thing you will not see in the staff analysis or any of the public considerations is those health impacts that we're talking about. We will, we will be, being precluded by federal law, we will not even discuss those. They are not part of our consideration at all. But we legally are allowed to use aesthetics and the effect on the viewshed, and that's been taken that's, to the state Supreme Court, and we're solid on that. That's correct. So that's and, I, and I would also project. note on, under the county's policy that it, the entrance quarters, which Route 250 is one, yeah, and it, is a, it, in historic districts are of special consideration. So that's mm -hmm. another factor that can weigh into the board's. Mm -hmm. The board's decision on this. And the Crescent Downtown Historic District and the Good Afternoon Historic District are located, as well as the Scenic Highway and the Court. Um, so
So the staff, when they're doing their evaluation, they will use our wireless ordinance for evaluation, even That's though it's correct. a tier three. The same standards for decision would apply. That's correct. Okay. Which is why they recommended against the one at Alamo. Because it didn't meet the rules. Okay, got it. But staff's analysis is just on that policy, and there's no, no waiting by us on all the other other factors that are injured. That's why, frankly, that's why there's a board decision versus a staff decision on it, so that all those other factors can be adequately considered. Is this, or would this be the tallest of the tier three in the county? I, I was just puzzling on that. I can't remember, Lori, if this one's actually taller than the Alamo one or not. Uh, it is, there are lots of towers that are taller than There are some older towers that are very the one by on Airport Road is, yeah. I don't know how tall it is, but it's visible for five miles. And the one by Fashion huge. Square. It would never be allowed. Fashion Square is huge. The one at Greenbrier is also huge. And those were all put out before the feet. rules existed. How big, is, how big was the one they put up at the forestry building that made it look like a tree? I, I don't know how tall it is, but its concealment has been rather effective because whenever I see it, I don't notice it. Which is funny, and I wasn't a fan of doing it at first. <laughs> <laughs> would, would it be shorter if they did three instead of six? Oh, for sure. carriers on it? Yeah. Why did you pick six? Five. Uh, five. 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 Why did they pick five? Well, it's a combination of the optimum height for Chantel, which okay. was the dedicated carrier at times. So Chantel wanted a certain rad center. Um, they wanted to be able to broadcast from under 135 and so if the school is going to be above that there has to be 10 feet of separation there so that was going to be 145 so that's where we started with what Chantel needed for the network. Is that fair? And, and I mentioned the one tower that <laughs> they are really disguised to look like trees and of course there are a whole lot of 150 foot trees <laughs> And people have different views of those things. I'm curious, is that even an option for a tower out here? Is it something you guys would ever All I can say is represent, representing the applicant for that particular one, the board did not look favorably upon the fake tree. Um, so <laughs> we thought it was ridiculous, but the forestry department wanted it, and we said, yeah. go. But you just said. But we all said you like it. Well, I, what we did make them do was to carry the fake greenery all the way to the ground. They had proposed stopping the fake greenery like 30 feet up, and that would have been until the <laughs> Would not have worked, let's put it that way. So. Uh, and another thing I'd note, and I know you said that the, after, uh, the uh, school lit board gave you the site. To your question, or to somebody made a comment, I think it seems like it would be interesting to know whether the lower. Ball field location, or when it's further off than 250, would be an option at all. Again, I'm just thinking about visual impact. I mean, it's a big tower, but if you move it back a couple hundred feet, yeah, but if you move it low, you can make the tower higher to make the height you know, requirement that they require. So maybe it's, yeah. Cool. It's a and this is the shooting for the moon request. Yeah. Right. Was, was the main point tower tier three, or did it come? through the process for a different reason. It was a tier three. It was tier three. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I, I, mean, I think Mark talked a lot about the county ordinance. Um, and, you know, we had this little bigger with more with five instead of um, I'll have three or four. I can't even remember. <coughs> but I guess one of the points I made then and I will make now is that, you know, I, I, I understand the benefits that it can provide to the school. Um, I, I, I did wonder when we were presented with the Elmore High School Tower and a lot of the content of the presentation was how much the school would benefit from this. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but to wonder how many people how people would feel if it was a private property owner who would be benefiting from this in this way. And so if we have an ordinance, you know, is it compelling to co-locate and um, use this business model so that it is more appealing for the schools and what was that you know, I mean this is under six months. Yeah. And so that came through and we were presented with lots of 
you know, how how students would be able to, you know, there would be no snow days anymore because people could work from home and they, they could have money to get tablets except the power goes out, so I don't know how that works, but maybe there's a power for that. I don't know. I just, I guess I that is one of my main stumbling blocks is if this was coming to us and it was just, on a piece of property and they were the benefits the financial incentives were removed from the school you know we have our ordinance in it i think it, it's a tricky play to maybe it would the crazy plaza <laughs> <laughs> is that thing related to the amount of money the police that the schools get yeah. for the and then the plaza and or is it do they get more because there's five um, powers co-located on it i mean is this would this bring in more revenue than the one that's in uh, Albemarle? Because of that. They'll get more revenue because they get you know forty percent of the rent from each carrier. So there are fewer carriers and there's less money. And then there's the one time fee for installing each carrier. But I still don't see how if this all goes into the general fund that it's gonna truly benefit Western more than other schools. I mean it's great that the whole pot it increases, but <coughs> Talk to your school board. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's 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 so I, I, I have a question, and I do, I'm just now clicking onto this. But the Albemarle Tower is only 125 feet tall. This one is 145 because a private company needs it to be highest, right? It has nothing to do with that's best for the school. It has to do with Chantel, is that the name of it? Sprint saying we need to have at least 135. So if you're going to get the school that, you have to make the tower larger. My question is, is that already, like this tower doesn't go up unless Chantel has its, I mean, why is the private company the one to dictate that this is going to be a monstrosity? And the picture that you took from 100 Miller School Road, that's our property, you took it from our driveway, our driveway is 500 feet long, goes down, our house is even higher and closer to that. So I'd love to send you a photograph to have a simulation done of that just to see what it will look like. But I'm wondering why a private company is the one who has the most influence of how tall kind of monstrosities. Well, in Alamore County, as in most Virginia counties now, it is not permitted for a tower developer to come in and say, I'm going to build a tower, a spec tower, and then invite carriers to come on once it's built. Because what happens, especially in the rural areas, is towers went up and there's nothing there. And, and that was very uh, an unhappy situation for boards of supervisors in the rural areas. So you have to have a carrier, you have to have a dedicated carrier to even make a submission for a wireless facility. And the carrier is, you know, a partner with Milestone, telling Milestone, this is what we need for this to serve our network right here. And that's why the design is driven by that carrier. But if Verizon had come forward, obviously a Verizon or an Antelos is going to be lower down the pole, so they don't seem to have a problem being lower than 135 well, you know, feet. I would estimate two hundred fifty thousand dollars to develop and build one of these things, and if you can come on and co-locate on something that's already there, you will compromise. And actually, if you can go on at one twenty-five or one fifteen, that's a lot better than building a single tier two monopole by yourself for two hundred fifty thousand dollars and being at eighty-five feet. So this is a great opportunity for carriers to get excellent service in the area with very little infrastructure costs. But are you saying that this tower would become economically viable, viable if, it was, if it was 120 feet rather than the 145 feet? Does it become, become reasonable financially or if it was stuck in the Did you know at what point it would become economically not viable? It would become less and less so until it reached right. that breaking point. But, you know, there, there, there yeah. be well, as, as, a, as a developer, we always go with what a client wants, and that's gentle. We will never build a tower that's higher than the height they need for their network. Uh, that's our starting point, always. Mm -hmm. So, so um, Chantel. So this is a fully funded by. So Chantel is building this entire, funding this entire project. This is no. Well, my so my milestone, 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 excuse me, is doing that. So we're portion. the steel guys. We're the guys that build the actual infrastructure, right. and we own the tower. And then our client is 
Shuntle, because they're the ones that come to us and say, hey guys, we really have this huge gap in this area. Can you help us build infrastructure so we can have our needs filled in the network? So it's a two. So as Milestone would construct the tower, we would then co-locate and get a building permit to put our equipment on site. Milestone's not going to do that without it. Right. 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 Have to have it here. Okay. Which was the company that, I'm just, I'm, I'm confused. The company that did Albemarle, the partner who did the Albemarle uh, High School Tower, oh, didn't need as much height. So, so height varies depending on geographic area and the configuration of the network. Um, so, you know, sometimes they don't need that much height, sometimes they don't need more. <coughs> Uh, it just depends on where their other uh, antennas are located within the network configuration, and it all depends a lot on topography. Uh, that's what drives the height and the character speed. So are you saying that the height of the tower is in part a result of where the school said they wanted it built? Yeah. What Mr. Roach was, was saying, yeah. maybe a lower place on a lower location, you're going to need to build a higher tower? Yes. You have to say and, and to follow up on um, Ms. Moore's remarks, if I were a private citizen looking to install this on my property for personal gain, uh, I would have shown up to represent uh, the interests and uh, discuss with individuals why we were making this decision. And I, I'm unaware of any school board members who have, who have shown up this evening. I'm, I'm unaware that uh, anybody has um, authored a letter uh, to, to uh, do they support this? Because I don't see any support from the school here. I see a, a, a you know technologist who's going to tell us how it's going to be used, um, but I don't see anybody from the school board who made the decision, right? Because you wouldn't be here if the school board didn't say we desire this, we want this on our property. You would not be here right now, and yet no one, no one from the school board has shown up to advocate for this. Mm. Well, I'm able to answer your questions regarding the school's use of the site with our technology. Representative. Um, I think I think he's done uh, done a great job. I got my questions answered, but we have other questions that remain. Yeah, um, it would have been nice if the school board. Right. 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 He made reference. They were from the school the Dean, yeah. Dean or Vince Shiver. Yeah, we did have, um, they were represented there and um, were able to give very specific, I think a little bit more specific questions that we're asking here about what they predicted as far as coverage and the advantages. Again, not speaking for them, but my main takeaway was they wanted to they would like to have seen this happen for Almar High School. That there were lots of advantages for the school. So and I guess they just assumed that it was going to win. We all sort of like tried to have that same contingency. But they didn't. See, it's not being expected of us tonight. They're going to be resolution related to this. So there's going to be another opportunity and perhaps we can reach out to the school board. I think, I think it's up to the group as to whether you want to well, see anything else or not. I mean, I think uh, they, they outlined their timeline. Planning commission will be sometime in February, so there's plenty of time. Right. You know, if we want to take a view, um, if we want to talk to the school Well, board, I, I think the relationship with the school is important. Uh, right. It's a public partner partnership with a private company. That relationship is important. I think all that said, though, I'd, I'd much rather see the tower at its lowest possible height rather than, you know, and if that meant only three instead of five, I probably would be okay with it and say, well, you know, more prone to say, well, that, that's what they have at Calvin Mall, it was approved there, you know, versus that we have to be the biggest kid on the block to get five, so squeeze five. I don't know if the county has any position on five versus three or what yet. Might depend on where you live. Well, I mean, it sounds like he's asking for, he's asking for 135, so that, there happens to be room below that for five. The other thing. Of the height already. Was, you know, how would you view it? Which I think is more yeah. yeah. If it was on, if it was on somebody's backyard, we'd be raising the hotel. Right. Right. And I think creatively this partnership with the public school leverages leverages the kids, which 
yeah. is, is, is really what it's planned because nobody wants to say no to the kid. And, and, and so that's a tough spot to be in. And I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very creative way to create business and, and form a partnership. Well, I think one of the considerations that Tom brings up and we've talked about around that we've not said was you know, we wouldn't be anywhere close to even thinking about it if this was in my backyard. And I'll rephrase what I said before because I don't want to speak not that part because I, I did mean what I said there. But for as far as the school board, when the Almoral um, Tower Cave of our planning commission I think the information we were presented with and some questions that came out tonight is how would that money be distributed and would it stay in this area or would it be the whole school district? And some of what we were told at planning commission that night were if there were extra money, these would be things that from a technology perspective they could provide to students. And which are all things that, you know, would be lovely to have every child with a tablet to take mm -hmm. home and all these things like that's what we heard and so i can't i mean it's only they, fair as uh, the, the taxpayers who are bearing the butt of the impact would benefit directly right i mean we were definitely given a snapshot of if there were money to be spent on things this might be the type of things the school could do that they currently maybe can't do but that, back to what you're saying. Well, it's not to say that there's not compromise no, somewhere. But, you know, like Tom yeah, is saying, there's probably some compromise out there. I'm just saying, you know, let's try to put it in an apple to apple. Right. And I, I, my biggest question is setting a precedent. We have yeah. ordinance and we say if it's okay for Almoral or then we go a little bit higher and we have a couple more a little bit bigger and the next month we'll hire a little bigger and then we have a private owner who has a really great location for some reason and then we say no to you because you're not and yeah i mean that to me is slippery slope well it means we live in court if we're right. not consistent then we have nothing on which to fall back it means our ordinance means nothing yeah. right that's a good point then you have an empty ordinance that's a very good point right. yeah. could i speak to that point yes um, the the analysis of the special use permit is the lender it's detrimental to the community, so there's a cost of the analysis there. There wouldn't be the same benefit if this were a private property benefiting just a private land on there. Um, that's why you know we don't bring that kind of application because it only benefits the carrier and the customers of the carrier. Um, but in this case, there are lots of factors other than the visibility, and even though our ordinance and our wireless policy only address visibility and that's all that the planning commission looks at the board looks at all of those benefits um, you know, detriments and benefits that's the point of a special use permit if I have access to a time I can call 911 I will tell you that that benefits me as a taxpayer and it benefits me as a citizen so, so any towers that benefit everybody in the community so, so it's a little bit different because we know that in times of emergency, all those systems get canned out. So if, the more access we have, the better off we are. So whether it's on school property or on my private property, it still benefits everybody. So I think that's a, not quite Well, I agree that it benefits everybody. I, I'm on your side with that. But I think there's there's more benefit um, to school property. And, and you're not going to see a carrier try to bring a 145 foot new facility on private property without that extra benefit to the community. Not now we can. The study point is we're going to go to fire that's what that was the hook. Exactly. It's always I think we have one more question here and then I think we'll probably wrap up here. Well no I'm just you know, when is this projected to be installed by like what is the year that this is going to be put in the public? When is the lease going for? But when is this going to be constructed, put in, available to the school? Uh, I mean, depends on how the approval process goes. Uh, but probably at the end of spring, early summer, will be construction start date. We have to go to site plan, building permit, and then take a little while. As Mr. Graham explained, the earliest we would be at the Board of Supervisors for final special use permit approval be April, probably, early April. So, and there's the site plan process after that. 
And so construction takes about how long in one of these? Six weeks. And um, well, and since this is a high school, the summer is probably what we would look at because it's school we have. Well, then, so if there's time, I think hearing from the school board is important, at least from my perspective, both how enthusiastic are they truly about this, what are their experiences so far with the Albemarle uh, Tower, if all the promises and the, and the great benefits of it are being realized yet, and I think the whole economic question of is there a benefit to a community that bears the brunt of, of one of these. I think we have time to hear from the school board. I think that would be important. We typically ask them to come when we might begin the springtime, so maybe this January is probably a good time. Yeah, could be a good year. With that specific question in mind. Right. Hmm? Sorry, Pat. Okay, next question is, if they have a Karen Tower, they get money now, revenue? They get any revenue now at Albemarle? I think they're they're migrating the material onto the new tower. Um, so I guess there's some revenue coming in there. Uh, so where does their money go? In the general fund too? It stays in the school department. But the general stays in the Yeah, I think say that question, I think that's stuff we can ask school board member um, if they come. Um, the last question I had is are there any other Towers in the county that you could point to. Obviously, you talked about Albemarle's, which is you know three units and 125. Mm -hmm. Are there any other towers you would say are similar to what the school would look like in, anywhere in the county that you're aware of? There Just give people few, um, a suggestion. I think maybe the closest analogy, if you can, if you can visualize when you're when you're looking at it, is is, is uh, power towers. On um, several power towers, typically from the bypass and heading east, uh, carriers put wireless antennas on top of those power towers, and those are mount holes. They're steel mount holes. So if you can eliminate from your vision, in your mind's eye, the wires, you could kind of get a sense of that. The reason why it's difficult to give you a good example is many of the facilities in Alamo County are just brown monopoles with one carrier on them, and then at the other extreme, we have the pre-ordinance facilities that are lattice tile towers, or guide wire towers. They're 300 feet tall, and they have six carriers. So you have two extremes. So are there specific transmission co-located facilities here that are okay. at that height? I don't know how tall those are. I, I, I'd have to, I'd have to check. Like Virginia Power, right? Mm -hmm. There, there are lots of Dominion power towers that have wireless. Right, but I'm okay, well, the yeah. Boy Tavern one is pretty tall. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that might be the closest out. Oh, Where? 64 Boy East. Tavern. At Boy Tavern, it's between 250 and 64, and it is a monster. It's, I think it's a last tower, isn't it? Uh, Maybe. But, and one other question I would like Mark to address, because I always get confused. The expansion ability. This would not be called a tier treetop anymore if it were approved and that means if I had the right category what Bill Fred says is once it gets put up the board cannot prevent the constant widening of the arrays out to 20 feet and that was the situation that is on the Georgetown Road thing which I was unhappy about too is if it's in that category and it's not restricted by the growth of the tree nearby reference tree or being called the treetop tower then once the pole is up we cannot we cannot prevent it's being increased 10 feet at a time in height or 20 feet wide. And so that I want that's something I will have to verify again, which I have to do every single time because I keep getting the categories mixed up. Uh, but anyway, that is something we need to be aware of also. It's not like the way that the board handled that with uh, Stony Point, which was also a tier three, which uh, Greg Kempner and <coughs> set conditions that categorized the height and the standoff, the collar and so on, as concealment elements that if defeated would, would then be a substantial and obvious in size. So, so you can do that with a tier three. You can circumvent the spectrum effect. However, that wouldn't apply here if we're 70 feet above the closest tree. There is no concealment element that's going to work. It's, it was the same situation with Stony Point. That was a tier three that appeared 
like a treetop tower, but it was not based on the reference tree. So, so they did do that. Uh, you know, that was the mechanism that they used. So the application should come forward with that in mind. This is all. Yeah, that's a, it's actually, you all are making a great point. Uh, as part of the board's consideration, they can put reasonable conditions uh, on, as, a, as, as, a, as part of approving a permit, the special use permit. Th those permit, those conditions obviously have to have a reasonable nexus to what our goals are within our, within our county policy. But uh, as long as we can make that nexus, we can set reasonable conditions. On the pole. So we're saying that if the uh, the trees go from 70 to 150 feet, that the tower can eventually go up to, to 250 feet. Is that what we're saying? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Right? Yeah. As the trees, as the tree, okay. it's not going to it's not going to go up. <coughs> right? The trees are in the line of yeah. sight. Okay. There, there's a provision for tier twos, which are the height of a tier two is is 10 feet taller than the tree of the you actually survey the heights of trees. Okay. Um, this not, is not, not for tier three. Okay. But the width of the array, as approved, could be considered a concealment element in itself yeah. at 50 inches or 80 inches. And, and the board could it. count that would it like 125 foot The restriction. Tower. Right. I mean, it's not set. Right. The board could say, hey, we're going from 145 to 125. If they I made a determination yeah. that the visual impact of the difference of the visual impact was inconsistent with county policy, yes. So, okay. And then it'd be so, up to the company to decide if they want to proceed based upon that's that. That's correct. Approval. Right. So the board could put that in as a contingency, say. Yeah, that's that was my point that when I said they are these are discretionary acts of the board. The board can can make a determination it's inconsistent with county policy. But we, we better be in a good position to be able to defend that based on the policy that we have. Well, the first basis was an updated photos with the fiber race on. That's one. That's essential. Before the, mm -hmm. So the that we can have with simulations that show the fiber. Okay. So this has been a great information presentation to the neighbors and to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for it that. It was done in a, a very congenial, collegial kind of way. <laughs> Did our last meeting. I just want to put that out. I appreciate that. Well, I certainly appreciate it. So thank you very much for uh, your presentation and the way you gave it. Thank you very much. And let me reiterate, I have cards. So if you have questions later, please don't have to take contact me. He's easily reached. Do you have that PowerPoint available to us? I, it, you know, it's so long, I, I, I can... I can I can package it and make it if you would like it, um, or I can send you pieces. Particular slides you're interested in? Yeah, the coverage slides. It's the coverage. The coverage. The coverage. The coverage. map. Mm -hmm. The way that map, map is, is available, that would be good. Yeah, if it was yeah without the photos, I mean, that would take that would make it more reasonable with the uh, you know, the maps and everything besides the photos. Yeah, it's just the map. Yeah. Okay. The pictures are. Okay. Okay. Good morning, Chris. Thank you, and gentlemen, I didn't get your name, but. Thanks a lot for the information, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then I'll reach out to the school board members and see if we can have a conversation and follow up in January. So I guess hold your thoughts that. Um, that was really our main agenda item for this evening. Um, I know what did the last meeting cost us mentioned about having a discussion about sort of growth versus infrastructure. And did we want to say anything specific to the board about that or not? I guess I'll leave it to the group to say it's 8.30. Do we want to have that discussion now? No. We have a <laughs> 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 That was very <laughs> too. It would be nice to know. Yeah, right. what? What? Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice to know from the county what infrastructure projects are on the drawing board and at what phase they're at. You know, where money, what time they expect. So in the C what's in the CIP coming yeah. our way? Right. Would be a great idea. And that, that can be a marvelous so in the new year when we have meetings with some breathing room. Right. The other one right. I forgot right. is I think Sean asked at the last meeting the possibility of having a Old Trail 101. Yep, I had sort of a list of 
future potential mm -hmm. topics mm -hmm. for some of our you know first quarter meetings, and that's another one. It, it would be also good for the ask Elaine because she was working on those projections of figures of build out. You know, yeah. if in fact she thinks with the build out, I mean, I know it's in the CIP, but is there in fact that the build out expected additional infrastructure projects that would be needed if they can look, in, look into the you know, telescope and see if they see anything on the horizon? The, uh, I think actually I talked to Elaine, I think she's going to be joining us for the February meeting, so maybe we can add that to that topic. I specifically asked her about doing your full trail sort of recap, you know, to give her longevity here. She said she might be able to, you know, at least add her perspective to that. Um, all right, sounds good. Um, any other I guess the other announcement, I'm not sure, has hit. Um, officially, although I think it's all been passed with the electoral board, is that there'll be a new precinct created at Laws. So we'll be back to five precincts in the Whitehall District again. Because the populations voting at Brownsville and Crozet have become so huge and having a hard time getting 3,000 people to reach those. So uh, that will be effective, as far as I know, starting for the 18th primary which means if you would like to be an election official or start to think about the people you can pass upon me, I now have to staff a whole new precinct out there. And so um, that will be a great, wonderful service to the community. Does so, that essentially take those two precincts and turn them into three? Yes. So it will shrink down. People basically south of, of uh, well, I'm not sure where the lines are there, but something like from Michigan <laughs> River, south of 250, and then some part of north as well. Anything else? Still won't have to drive very far. So, so if, if I could have bring up the data on the survey, and I'll turn it over to Sean to tell you what we are, where we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have a question mark. <laughs> right. We, we, we did have some problem in getting some of the data validated, which was, I guess, the biggest hurdle that we come coming up against. And that's kind of been worked out, essentially, with the aid of some more money from the Jose Board of Trade, thankfully. and. Uh, yeah, so essentially we have all the data in, it's in good shape now, and it's really on my shoulders to to crunch the numbers and put it in a sort of digestible way for everyone. Um, the plan is for the Gazette to run uh, at least the top line numbers in their January edition so everyone that will be everyone's first look at the raw numbers and then we will hold a session or two one probably in the ccac and one outside of it maybe a special meeting where we can dig a little deeper into the numbers and and what we should actually then do with these numbers from the voice of, of you know the community uh, where there's consensus where there's disagreement um, and how to sort of best leverage this undertaking that that uh, certainly took a lot of time and effort, and so we should we should maximize the benefit from the data as much as we can. We can talk about the ways in which we can do that. Sean, sure. are you going to be the author of that uh, first document? Uh, I'll be one of the principal. Right, the only reason I say that is because the first presentation is generally the most important. That's the one that people will remember, focus on. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think our basic plan was between me and Tom Gudebrock, who is the director of the survey center at UVA, who kind of also was the other technical expert on this, we'll, we'll come up with some sort of presentation for everyone and, and eventually try to get together a comprehensive report all the data eventually will be available to people online right. to look at sure. so they can peruse it at their own leisure. Um, but it does take a little while to make sense of it and to tell the story out of all the data because it's just not about numbers. We right. want to sort of talk about where where most people in Crozet see development going, what they what they want, how they currently assess, you know, where we are. And I think that will greatly inform some of the some of the discussions that we have around this table based on now we, we sort of have anecdotal right. evidence of what people want in Crozet, but a great thing about a survey is 
you get a sort of a scientific snapshot of of what does the average perversion Rosation. How they see it. It's not great. I mean, I just know I mean one of the reasons it took so long is because we did do a scientific survey. And one, unlike the last survey, which we did get, you know, good input from, this one is, you know, we were much more careful with the data and making sure that it was, you know, reliable data, incredible data that if we go into the county. That's statistically significant. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just talking about the initial narrative. Yeah. yeah. And Your I survey could be great. I mean, that was our thought at how to present now that we're getting, Sean, getting closer was since it ran in the Gazette, even though lots of people got the letter with the code from the scientific sample, running it in the Gazette, and then, you know, that would be, a, it would be a really easy way for people to see everything. Yeah. And then I think the idea, at least, tentatively what we talked about was then hosting that community meeting because there's a lot of stuff in here it's not just about you know development it there's tons of things that people might find interesting people have time to digest it see what they were surprised to see see what they what questions they have and then come to that community meeting where we have sean and tom Bruderbach to talk about process that people might have questions about and dig into it some and then hopefully come to this group and maybe refine some of the topics to those specific so master planning type issues. Well, I think it's going to be very important for a conversation on like infrastructure to see Absolutely. the details of it. And then, do you remember our number from the scientific? I didn't write How many? Yeah. Uh, we're in the 700s of, of valid completed surveys, so that gives you a pretty good number to work with. And then an almost equal number of the general public. Yeah. So and I'll be fascinated when you get to the point of being able to assess the similarities and differences, if there are any between the two groups. Yeah, that was one of the first things we, we looked at. And I would say for the most part there was broad similarities between the public and the scientific Good. sample. There were some instances where it varied. Mm -hmm. We can get into that if you want. But uh, the difference is, you know, it's a different, it's a slightly different person who volunteers to take a survey than those who are asked to take a survey. Mm -hmm. You could probably imagine that the ones who volunteer are a little more engaged. Um, so that's why uh, we'll probably be using the scientific for most of the presentation because that's the, that's the truest representation of the community. But as far as an interest level to have 1,400, so, yeah. Out of the five to six thousand residents here is an astonishing number when the countywide survey was three hundred and eighty two. Thirty percent response <laughs> rate on, on surveys we would be doing very well. Right. And I think there might be those questions we talked about side by sides and that getting a bit confusing, but there might be certain particular questions where it might be we could show you could show a side by side scientific compared to those that self selected. Well, people like to take surveys the closer to home it is for them. Right. Well, all good stuff. Good, yeah. good stuff More to come in the new okay. year. And with that, unless anybody has anything yeah. else. I just want to, I'll say, well, I'm sorry, is that I would like to thank, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I want to thank the people, Sean and uh, yeah. Tom Gruderbach and Tim, and I mean, other, other others of us are there in the background, you know, like, what can we do? <laughs> we don't, you know, so, have, <laughs> but we, without that, and we did have um, people donate some money, and Jose Board of Trade supported that effort, but without Sean and Tom Gruderbach and Tim Tolson, we wouldn't have this. Yeah, that's one of the great things about Crozet is if you need to find somebody with the skill set, they usually can find somebody who's good enough right. to step up and provide those skill sets. Right, and here we look, Sean came in because the survey interests him and we snagged him 
we told you now a little bit. You got a little interested in our survey, and here you are.